Good morning, everyone. All right, let's do that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. See, I used to run a state party, so I've got to get everybody engaged and active. How's everybody doing today? We are happy to have you with us this morning. Uh, my name is Basil Smichael. I am the director of the public policy program here at Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. So welcome. How many of you have been here before? Okay, so how many of you are new to this space? Well, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for coming. We have a lot, there's a lot that goes on in this space and in this building. Um, so uh, hopefully you were able to sign uh, your name to our list upstairs so that you can get information about all the great programs that are uh, run at Roosevelt House, whether it's in this building or one of our classroom spaces upstairs. Welcome, and we're, we're, we're grateful to see you. Thank you for coming on this chilly morning. Um, our program this morning is the democracy study group that uh, Roosevelt House and Hunter College are doing in conjunction with uh, the Cornell Brooks Public Policy School and the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs um, at Cornell University, my alma mater. So I have a little sweater just, just showing my little school alma mater pride, but I'll cover it up because I know where, I, where, I'm, where my bread is buttered. Um, and thanks to the Century Foundation for also partnering um, on this great uh, program today. I want to introduce or uh, say hello and acknowledge uh, my boss, the director of the Public Policy Institute here at Roosevelt House, Harold Holzer. Harold, um, good to see you this morning. Thank you. I also want to say hello to a good friend of mine, the former chair of the New York State Republican Party, Ed Cox. Good to see you, sir. Morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Emily from um, the Institute of Politics uh, and Global Affairs for your support today. I'd like to also um, say hello and thank you to the staff here at Roosevelt House. Danny, who's on the AV up there, uh, I'd like to say he's on the turntables, but it, we don't really have turntables, so it's he's manning switches and dials and screens. So thank you for your support today. Um, Bianca, who you met, may have met upstairs, um, uh, Phil, Aaron, and uh, Peter for all of their support um, on, on our Roosevelt House events. I don't want to take up much time because I really want to um, get to introducing um, Steve Israel, who's director of the Institute for Politics and Global Affairs, and thank him so much uh, for the work that he has done to, uh, to uh, bring this together. We have a fantastic panel, but also thinking about the work that I do and, and my connections. Wanted to, I want to take the moment to say hello to Jeff and good to see him again. He was my classmate. We were classmates at, uh, at, uh, at, at Columbia and it's amazing how um, you, know, you, you end up seeing and working with a lot of the same people over the course of your career and it's a, a great moment of pride to um, welcome, um, welcome him here as well as, um, as, well as the, uh, our other panelists um, this, this morning who Steve will um, introduce. So, Again, thank you so much for coming. It's great and wonderful to see you. And please, please, please come back. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am former Congressman Steve Israel. These days, the word former is just a beauty, uh, <laughs> much more preferable. Uh, I want to uh, thank you all for joining with us. I especially want to thank uh, Roosevelt House uh, and our friends at Hunter for partnering with Cornell University's Institute of Politics and Global Affairs on these uh, democratic uh, study groups. Uh, so you call it the Roosevelt House. I am a, I'm a fan of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I actually own a little bookstore in Oyster Bay, shameless plug, uh, called Theodore's. Uh, and we concentrate uh, on American history with an emphasis on Theodore Roosevelt, One, a, a matter of some uh, trivia is that um, the Democrats were the Roosevelts, the Republican branch of the family were the Roosevelts. So uh, welcome to the Roosevelt House on behalf of somebody who supports Roosevelt. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge several community leaders, of course Harold Holzer, who's really one of the preeminent historians uh, in America today, a wonderful author whose books we sell at Theodore's, by the way. Uh, thank you for your uh, leadership. Uh, Ambassador Barrett Bossi, the Consul General of Denmark, is with us. Um, Ed, Ed Cox has already been recognized, the former chair of the New York State Republican um, Party. Garrett Armwood, uh, who is the deputy state director uh, for Senate, the majority leader Schumer, uh, is with us. Israel Nitzan, the deputy consul general uh, of Israel in New York, is with us. Uh, Suffolk County legislator Bridget Fleming is with us. Former Nassau County executive Laura Curran uh, is here. 
Former Hempstead Supervisor uh, Laura Gillen is here. New York State Public uh, Service Commissioner Tracy Edwards uh, is with us as well. A very quick word about the Cornell University Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. Our mission is very simple. We exist in order to deepen discourse and raise understanding uh, of complex political challenges. And one of our projects is the recently established Bipartisan Democratic Study Group. Uh, what we're doing is taking deep dives into the unique influences uh, of, uh, that uh, are bearing uh, upon democratic discourse and democratic norms uh, in the United States. This morning we're going to be looking at electoral attitudes. Next spring we'll be convening at Hyde Park, home of the Roosevelt's, uh, for a discussion with several members of Congress and subject experts uh, on the state of democracy around the world, the rise of authoritarian movements uh, around the world. Uh, and also next spring we'll be convening a program in Ithaca on the impact of social media uh, on democracy and democratic discourse. Uh, next June, we'll be doing a summit at Cornell Tech on the other side of the river uh, on the intersection of climate, technology, and democracy. And then in the first week of May, we're bringing a delegation to Greece, the birthplace of democracy, to study uh, the uh, health of democracy uh, in Europe and around the world uh, that is open to whoever would like to uh, participate. So we hope that you will join us for that. I also, I do want to acknowledge somebody else who's quite special. Uh, uh, and um, the reason that I was in Congress for 16 years is because I had just an extraordinary staff. Uh, and my former chief of staff is with us today, Mark Siegel, who was just appointed by President Biden uh, to the board of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. Mark, thank you for everything that, uh, that you do. So this morning, we study uh, what, if anything, the unpredictable midterm elections teach us uh, about uh, electoral attitudes uh, on democracy. And I'm going to introduce our panelists and then turn it over to Jeff Pollack uh, to lead us off. Uh, we're joined by John McLaughlin. Uh, he has worked professionally as a strategic consultant and pollster for 40 years. During that time, he's earned a reputation for helping some of America's most successful corporations and winning some of the toughest elections uh, in the nation and really around the world. Uh, in 2016 and, two and 2020, he worked as an advisor and pollster for Donald Trump from the primaries through election day. His political clients have included former presidential candidate Steve Forbes, Fred Thompson, former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, former uh, Georgia Governor Nathan Deal, 22 current and former U.S. Senators, and 16 current Republican members of Congress. His international work uh, has included uh, political uh, consulting in Israel uh, for the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, uh, former Can Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper of Canada. Uh, he's advised Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, and he has polled in many uh, countries ar around the world. He's appeared on every major broadcast and cable channel, as well as prominent radio talk shows across America, and his articles have appeared in a wide range of publications, uh, including Newsmax, National Review, Middle East Quarterly, Campaign and Elections, and The Polling Report. Jeffrey Pollack is the founding partner of Global Strategies Group, a premier strategic research and communications firm. Uh, Jeff's firm was my pollster when I ran uh, in every single election and was also um, the pollster of, of preference of the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee when I was the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. When I really needed to know what was going on somewhere in a tough district or nationally, Jeff was the person I would call and say, could you help, help us figure it out? Uh, the New York Times, he was twice awarded pollster of the year by his peers in the Bipartisan American Association of Political Consultants. The New York Times has called him one of the country's leading pollsters. Uh, his political clients include governors like J.B. Pritzker in Illinois, Kathy Hochul in New York, Ned Lamont in California, Senators Kirsten Gillibrand, Joe Manchin, Ed Markey, Jackie Rosen, Attorney General Letitia James, and many members of the House and Senate. Uh, his international work includes the Dominican Republic, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Kazakhstan, Albania, Trinidad and Tobago, Georgia, and Kosovo, and he regularly appears on ABC, CNN, and Fox News Channel. Uh, I will also tell you that he, uh, from time to time you see a film where there's a political pollster, uh, and from time to time you see Jeff playing Jeff in these films. He's a proud member of the, street, the Screen Actors Guild, by the way, for, for those appearances and interviewing. John and Jeff, uh, Cornell University professor Doug Kreiner. Uh, his teaching and interests focus on American political institutions and the separation of powers as well as US foreign policy and science and health policy. 
He's the faculty director of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University, and Clinton Rossiter Professor in American Institutions in the Department of Government. He's the author or, uh, or co-author of five books, including most recently, The Myth of the Imperial Presidency, How Public Opinion Checks the Unilateral Executive. He received his undergraduate degrees from MIT and a PhD from Harvard. Uh, and of course, Basil Smeichel uh, will be joining Professor Kreiner uh, in, in this interview. He is a distinguished lecturer and director of public policy program here at Roosevelt House um, and uh, was appointed by Governor David Patterson to serve as the executive director of the New York State Democratic Party during the 2016 presidential cycle. He holds a PhD in politics and education and an MPA from Columbia University and of course received his Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. Please welcome all of our guests. And Jeff, we're going to have you kick it off. Thank you, Congressman. Good to be here. Um, it is so nice of you to import all of Long Island to, uh, to uh, this little island today. So um, uh, I would like to just take a couple of minutes um, uh, to talk about um, what happened. Um, it is what we call a, what we're calling a choice election. Um, uh, my friend Mark Siegel, who um, uh, who Steve recognized before, who is uh, a very old friend of mine, uh, who is my literally my first client, which you may not know, um, uh, and I, Mark had me teach uh, one of his class the week before the election, and I was just miserable. Um, I cannot tell you, I was down, I was dour, things were going to hell, um, the Democrats were going to lose everything, it was just abysmal. And then election day happened, and I said, um, I really wanted to title this presentation, What the Fuck Happened? Um, but my staff wouldn't let me do that for some reason. So um, let me try to give at least a, a hint about what happened and what we, what we think happened. Um, so why did we think things were going to be so bad? Well, things should have been bad. Joe Biden's uh, approval rating was at 40%. Uh, approximately. Um, economic sentiment was abysmal. Um, and so the approximate number of seats that Joe Biden should have lost is 45 seats. Now, we actually knew that he couldn't lose 45 seats, or that we couldn't, because structurally, uh, there, um, uh, the Republicans, frankly, had done well enough in the election before that there weren't 45 seats to lose. But it still should have been a bad election under all circumstances. The second reason that we thought things were bad is that um, partisanship um, and partisan antipathy um, is at uh, the zenith, meaning Democrats hate Republicans, Republicans hate Democrats, uh, and those numbers are, are at a high. Um, and split ticketing is at the lowest ever. So all of these things combined to bad economic climate, bad presidential job approval rating, all this partisanship says things are going to be a problem. So if you look at the job approval for Biden at the time, as I said, in the low 40s, 41.4 um, uh, on average, but there was this weird thing happening, which was that in the generic congressional ballot, so the generic is, if the election were held today, who would you vote for, the Democratic candidate or the Republican? And the, the, that question tends to give us a hint or a clue as to how the election is going to go. Um, on election day, the Republicans had about a 1% advantage on the job approval, uh, on, uh, sorry, on the congressional ballot. It doesn't really make sense. If Joe Biden is sitting there at 41, right, the, the gap there is a 12-point gap between approval and disapproval, there really shouldn't only be a one-point gap in the generic. You would have figured that more people were voting for Republicans. So why was that? And maybe we should have been a little more confident that things weren't going to be so bad for the Democrats. The reason is, is that Joe Biden's job approval may not have been very good. In this poll, for example, it's at 42. But the reason for that is 21% of Democrats disapproved of him, um, and 73% of independents disapproved of him. But if you look at the generic, and again, in this particular poll, the Democrats were up four. It doesn't really matter. Um, uh, um, the, the, the data underneath is what matters. Only 4% of Democrats were saying they were going to vote for a Republican. And among independents, they said um, they were voting Republican only 33 to 24 at the time, with 40% saying undecided. So the point is, even though the president's job approval was bad and there was a bunch of Democrats who didn't like him and a bunch of independents who didn't like him, they weren't ready to vote for the Republicans. And then the election happened. 
So what we know is that the Democrats did incredibly well. Um, the Democrats won 73% of all the toss-up races um, by the Cook Report. The Cook Report, one of the neutral um, uh, political reports that says which race is sort of in play. The Democrats won three-quarters of them. That's historic when you think about what happened um, uh, in the past. In these past midterm races, um, the, uh, the party in power um, normally wins, normally uh, loses um, uh, in the midterm and the party in power wins this time. Just historic. The Democrats do incredibly well in a lot of places, um, particularly when you look, for example, at governors. And governors is an interesting story. Um, the Democrats flip Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, and Arizona, Arizona being the hardest one. Uh, Massachusetts and Maryland, though, we think that's easy for the Democrats, except there have been very, very popular Republicans there for eight years. Some of the most uh, popular uh, Republican governors in the nation were in uh, Massachusetts and Maryland. The only one that the Republicans are able to flip is Nevada. And then everything else is a hold, but a lot of those are Democrats, particularly tough states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, Kansas, uh, Oregon, which ended up being very difficult. So what I believe on the governor's races that happen is different than what happened in the president in, in the uh, congressional races. I believe that all of those governors, by and large, were rewarded for how they performed on COVID. And that includes Ron DeSantis. Um, and it includes Steve Sisolak in Nevada, who lost, I believe, in part because he held the state or closed the state down what they felt too long. I'm not making a judgment. Uh, I obviously think Ron DeSantis is a schmuck um, and think that you know what he did in Florida was terrible and, oh my God, 20,000 more people died there than should have, but clearly he doesn't care about that. But So let's just put that aside. Politically, he did what the state wanted. He kept it open. And I believe all these governors, whether it's Governor Lamont um, uh, in, uh, in Connecticut or, um, or uh, Pritzker in Illinois, and even in a place like Colorado where, frankly, Jared Polis did a mixture. He closed it down and then opened it up uh, much quicker. I think governors were rewarded for COVID, and we saw this in data all across the country when you ask people um, uh, in surveys what they thought of their governor, even though they weren't talking about it in the closing weeks of the election, people were talking about COVID. So this wasn't a national election. It's a collection of local elections. Um, lots of interesting things. This is a, uh, a graph from the New York Times. The blue arrows show counties shifting from 2020 presidential to 2022 Senate. So the reason all the states aren't on there is these are only um, Senate race um, uh, um, states. So look at all those blue arrows in Pennsylvania and just how incredible the shift was in Pennsylvania. Look at all those red arrows in New York and how clear the red shift was uh, in New York. Look at Florida, dramatic. So there are different stories here, including a place at the bottom that's the Oklahoma special election. Democrats are never winning in Oklahoma in my lifetime, I don't believe. Um, and yet look at all the blue shift there. So there really was local stuff going on in all these places. Why? So why did the Democrats do well? It doesn't actually still make sense when you go through the data because on election day, the party identification for the country was, or for the voters, was plus three Republican. What that means is, do you identify yourself as a Democrat or Republican? So nationally, it was Republican plus three in 2022. In 2018, for example, when the Democrats did incredibly well, it was D plus four, Democrat plus four. In 2014, when the Republicans did well, it was R plus one. So the party identification would have suggested that the Democrats should have gotten crushed. And it's equally obvious when you look, or not obvious, when you look at the states in Arizona, R plus six, in Georgia, R plus six, meaning again, party identification was in favor of the Republicans in all of these swing states. So how on earth did the Democrats win? And it's this, very, very simply. The party in power normally loses independent voters. So again, the Democrats are the party in power. We should have lost independent voters. In 2006, when the Republicans were in charge, they lost independence by 18 points. In 2010, when the Democrats were in charge, we lost independence by 18 points. In 2022, we won independence by two points. That is historic. And again, in the Senate races, it's even more impressive. In Arizona, we won the independence by 16. Georgia, 11. Nevada, 3, which I'll get to in a second. Pennsylvania, massive, 20 points. And New Hampshire, 11. So 
This is the number one reason independents voted Democrat. There's a couple other things. In 2018, Donald Trump's job approval going to election day was 45 to 54, negative nine. In 2022, going to election day, Joe Biden's job approval was 44 to 55. Same thing. These are identical numbers. However, when you look at the voters in 2018, if you approved of the job that Donald Trump did, 77% of those voters voted Republican. In 2022, if you approved of Joe Biden, 89% voted for the Democrat. So there's better consolidation for Biden. But the bigger one is this next bucket. If you somewhat disapproved of either, in 2018, if you somewhat disapproved of Donald Trump, you voted against the Republicans by a 29-point margin. In 2022, if you somewhat disapproved of Joe Biden, you still voted for the Democrats by a plus-four margin. Massive difference. So again, we could have seen, we did see this. This is going back to what I talked about with that difference with the job approval, the Biden job approval, and yet the generic congressional wasn't matching the sort of pessimism. It's because people who somewhat disapproved of Biden were not ready to vote against the Democrats. Um, what other reason? Mr. McLaughlin talked about this more, but jo Donald Trump is a big friggin' loser uh, on, on election day, right? I mean, there's no question about it. The candidates he chose all across the country, by and large, um, lost. In the House races, for example, there's only four competitive races um, uh, whose candidates he endorsed um, and won. Two of those four races, the Democrats didn't even compete in. Um, so they weren't even on the map. Um, in Secretary of State's races, these election deniers were rejected um, in competitive places, in places like Arizona, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, and the governor's races I already went through. Final thing, uh, and then I want to wrap up and get um, and pass to John. One thing that I think is really, um, uh, I'll, do, I'll do two things. One thing that I think is underrated, uh, the Democrats had incredibly experienced candidates. The Republicans had incredibly inexperienced candidates. Um, in each of these races, this is a New York Times um, uh, or 538 um, uh, graph, what it shows you, for example, is in Arizona, um, uh, 538 suggests that the state leans Republican by seven points. And the needle, the New York Times needle, suggested um, that Mark Kelly would end up winning by three. He ended up winning by five, but, um, but that was a prediction. So I say 10-point difference between partisan uh, lean and how the Democrat did. Look at Arizona, New Hampshire, Georgia, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Ohio even, and Nevada. The Democrats are outperforming that partisan differential by huge numbers across the board. Which one is the weakest one? It's all the way at the bottom is Nevada. Catherine Cortez Masto, experienced candidate. Adam Laxalt, experienced candidate, a man who's actually won a statewide race. All of these other candidates never had a competitive race. And so not only were many of these candidates extreme, um, uh, which was a problem for them, but they were also incredibly inexperienced. Um, okay, uh, just want to show you this. So how did the Democrats win? This is our, this is my recipe for what happened. You had extreme Republicans, two things. Dobbs obviously changes the equation on abortion, Com national conversation on it. I can't tell you how many people said, oh, Democrats, you're talking too much about abortion. They were wrong. Um, and secondarily, the MAGA movement. Uh, I was involved in a project um, nationally for the Center for American Progress talking about MAGA, trying to brand the Republicans more um, uh, as MAGA Republicans. Um, the president uh, took that mantle up as well. Uh, and at the end of the day, it was a very important thing of showing Republican extremism uh, in many of these candidates. At the same time, you had responsible Democrats, strong candidates, experienced candidates, but also an actual record to run on that the voters um, were quite pleased with. That ended up with a choice instead of what should have normally been a referendum uh, on Joe Biden. Um, final thing. Um, I said, abortion. People said the Democrats are talking too much about abortion. Here's what we know. Among those voters who said that jobs and inflation was the most important thing and not abortion, that's 48% of all the voters. Republicans won those voters by 45. It's a big number. Among those voters who said abortion was the most important issue, not the economy, that's 18% of the vote, Democrats won them by 60, 64 
But among those who said both abortion and the economy was important, 12% of the vote, Democrats won them by 27. And among those who said neither the economy or, abor uh, or abortion were uh, the most important, Democrats won them by 20. So sure, Democrats were not winning on uh, jobs and inflation. There wasn't a great argument to make. Um, uh, but uh, on abortion and other things, the Democrats led the way. Um, I'm going to talk more later, but I'd rather get to, um, uh, I'd rather let John. You, what, what, what do you, you want me to keep talking about winning? I mean, usually, usually that's your thing. You're learning? Oh, well, all right, I'll give you one other thing. Here's your MAGA, here's your MAGA penalty. So this, this is, I think, a fascinating thing. So nationally, two, among voters who self-ID as MAGA Republicans, um, well, sorry, one-third of all Republicans say, I'm not a MAGA Republican. Two-thirds uh, say they are. So among those who identified as a MAGA Republican, only 2% of those people voted for a House Democrat. I'd like to find those two, by the way, right? But among those who said they were non-MAGA Republicans, 10%. That's big in this. I talked about polarization where there's no ticket splitting. That's big. But it's even bigger when you look at some of these things. Look at the Pennsylvania governor's race, um, Josh Shapiro, a race that I did. Um, among voters who self-ID as MAGA Republicans, 5% voted for Shapiro. But among those non-MAGA Republicans, almost 40% voted for Josh Shapiro. That's amazing. And in the Senate race, you can see it was much tighter because Fetterman was seen uh, as far more liberal, far more um, uh, democratic, frankly. Um, but even still, Fetterman got 11% of them. Same thing in Georgia. This is the reason Raphael Warnock is a senator, is because of this. Stacey Abrams only got 7% of those non-MAGA Republicans. Warnock got 16. So MAGA and extremism definitely uh, mattered. All right, now I'm going to shut up. John's all you. I'm going to get to the end. Thank you for the opportunity. I don't, I don't normally get to do presentations with a lot of Democrats like this, but but uh, it is good. But in the meantime, Erin King Sweeney is the one who asked me to do this. So and and having worked for her dad for he made me look good for like 28 years. So Erin uh, uh, has the flu, so she's not here. But I showed up. So uh, uh, but in the meantime, um, it, for a kid who grew up in the Bronx in Rockland County to be on the stage here with the uh, with Jeff, uh, Jeff is like the best Democrat pollster in the country. And Steve, when you ran the DCCC, I mean, I, when you would come in races, I just didn't want to be on the other side. But uh, fortunately, this year in New York, we had Ed Cox and others who uh, who made us much more competitive than we started out when we thought. Because uh, I often would tell people around the country, because uh, I work all over the country, and we were talking about the New York redistricting, et cetera. And uh, I said, like, for us Republicans here, it's like being in the Alamo. And you're just, you know, you, the, the statistics, you know, to, and that's the other part is, too, is a really good friend of mine. Did you know Pat Cadell? Yeah. Pat was a great pollster. And uh, uh, he'd actually helped Donald Trump, too. So, but the, uh, but he, having been Jimmy Carter's pollster, I got to know him later on in life. And uh, he had a saying that the Democrats were the crooked party. Sorry, no offense to people here. And I, I, I told uh, I, I told Steve before I got here. I said my my ancestors, uh, my grandfather was cousin to Jimmy Walker, so they were all Tammany Hall Democrats back in the day. But then you moved to the suburbs, so. Uh, um, but he used to say the Democrats were the crooked party, and the Republicans were the stupid party, and it 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 kind of holds up in this election because I'm going to show stats, not as many slides, but I'm going to show some stats where even though we didn't talk during the campaign, our candidates talked, debated each other, but a lot of the numbers are the same and the conclusions are the same. And for those of us who, like a lot of times when I'm going around the country and I'm talking to other Republicans, I'm like, how do you lose a race in South Dakota? I mean, how do you lose a race in Kansas? I don't know. I grew up in New York where usually a two to one against us and it takes a lot of Democrats to elect Republicans in New York. So you're always trying to get Democrats to switch. And most often it's by rejecting their own candidate. But, uh, uh, but, but you know, for the Republicans, it's gonna be, this is really a discussion about a missed opportunity. 
and I'm, I'm very critical of my own party on this. If you go to the first slide, Danny up there. Oh, I can do, oh, I can do this myself? You're in trouble now. Let me see. I got it, good. Oh, I always go right. Um, <laughs> but to me, this was, this was the most telling number in every poll we take. And this is the one that Jeff was probably afraid of too. The country, when you asked where the United States was, 68% said wrong track. I mean, every vote every Republican get existed in that 68%. And they should have been pushing it. Most of my candidates, I would tell them, push this every day. Country's on the wrong track, inflation, crime, et cetera. Make that issue. And you can see here, the Republicans, the ones who voted for Congress, and by the way, these numbers are from a November 8th post-election survey that we did, just like Jeff's numbers were his. What's amazing is we got a lot of the same numbers. He's a very good pollster. <laughs> you went to Columbia? He, yeah, see, see I, I, these Ivy League guys, I went to the Poison Ivy League, Fordham, uh, in the Bronx, but, but Jesuit school, so <laughs> they don't even recognize Trump's pollster. It's like, forget it. You know, we were hoping you'd be a Democrat. So, but, it, but anyway, um, but you see there, if they voted for a Republican for Congress, 89% said the country's on the wrong track. But the Democrats, 45% said wrong track, but they still voted for Democrats, which is an amazing statistic. We started asking this in uh, uh, October because the disconnect started happening in September. Bless you. It started happening in September where if 68% say the country's on the wrong track, why aren't the Republicans you know, doing better? Why aren't they over 50%? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, Democrats wouldn't let us get away with this. <laughs> so, so when we asked, do you think it's among those who said the country's on the wrong track, uh, do you think, uh, it's Joe Biden's fault that the United States is on the wrong track. Only 68% of that 68% said it was true. That's 46%. So less than half the country thought this was Biden's fault, which, which tells you that the Republicans were not running an aggressive enough campaign. Because if the majority of Americans say the country's on the wrong track, but it's not the president's fault, uh, you know, that's, to me, it's the, they were missing the point. And the candidates that we had, most often in places like we had, all of our incumbents won for Congress, um, had some long shots that didn't come in, Lee Zeldin and, and Bob Stefanowski, but they were, they were long shots. Uh, you know, Most Republicans rode us off in those states, but uh, for the reasons that Jeff described about governor's races, but we ran aggressive campaigns. And, uh, uh, and here for, Cong uh, and for Congress, we also, our firm, we kept Katko's seat Republican and we picked up uh, three seats in New York where it was, uh, we, we polled for D'Esposito, Santos, and uh, for Mike Lawler uh, uh, in, in that race. And then in Florida, we picked up two more seats. So we netted five seats from Democrats. Like we had seven incumbents win in Florida for Congress and we had, uh, um, we had uh, 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 Lee and Bean also take seats that were held by Democrats. So uh, I don't know what these other Republicans were doing. But I do know when I was looking at Joe Biden's job disapproval, because you were looking at approval, I'm looking at disapproval. Because in effect, when you, when you look at it, it was 52 on election day, and that was down from 60% in July. And when you think about, it was 60% disapproved in July, and then we had 55 in August, 50 in September, and 52. The Republicans were not aggressively going after Joe Biden the way Democrats would go after Donald Trump. And what was amazing was that Republicans were being defensive and split about President Trump when we should have been going after Joe Biden. And Democrats do a much better job at uniting than Republicans. Republicans, we like to eat our own. We like to fight every now and then. So that's why the primaries are already on before this started. But when you look at it, if they vote a Republican, uh, if, they, if they vote a Republican, uh, on, the, on the rating on Joe Biden, uh, the Republicans for Congress, it was 88 disapprove, 11 approve. And uh, the Democrats, it was 85 and 13, 85 approved. So, that, so what Jeff was talking about with, that, with the, the approval holding for him, if they approved, they stuck with him. And then this is the other thing that the Republicans have a big problem with because inside the Republican infrastructure, there was a big focus on, they had a great time in 2002 when they you know, had a really good midterm because they created a 72-hour program. 
So they focus on election day. And during the 2020 campaign, a lot of us were hearing from the Republican National Committee, oh, there's no signs of a, a Biden operation. There's no signs of, of a, a ground game. They were looking in all the wrong places. They didn't, I mean, how do you go door to door during COVID? But in the meantime, uh, David Pluff, who's probably the smartest Democrat strategist, except for Jeff on the other side, uh, had written a book about how to defeat Donald Trump, Citizen's Guide to Defeat Donald Trump, where he talked about registering new voters. He talked about, in a few counties, because our strategy in 2016 was to increase the turnout in battleground states for Trump, which we did. So it went up from 130 million turnout to 139 million turnout in, in 16. But then the Zuckerberg funded nonprofits put it on steroids. And during COVID, you had 160 million, but it was mostly coming in mail and early voting. And uh, there was one time where, um, in t about a week out from the election in 2020, I get this phone call. I'm in the office at 9 o'clock in the morning, but somebody called me from Nevada, and it was 6 o'clock in the morning out there. And he, and he says, what's this poll that has me down 17 points in Wisconsin? And I said, uh, and it was President Trump, and I said, I said, you're not down 17 in Wisconsin. It's a dead heat. And, and he says, why would the Washington Post put out a poll like that? And I said, well, they don't want you to be president. And the reason is they know, because we all started asking if you voted early. Did you vote absentee? Did you vote early in person? Did you vote, uh, uh, you know, are you going to vote on election day? And the early vote had Trump losing two to one to Biden. The election day vote was coming for Trump two to one. So what would happen, I said to the president, I said, they're trying to suppress your vote. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, first of all, it's skewed Democrats, eight points. And he says, do they know what they're doing? I said, they, they're PhDs, they know what they're doing. And I, and I said to him, I said, if it's Wisconsin and it's cold and snowy and people are worried about COVID, they're trying to tell your voters not to show up. So you gotta go there and tell them to show up. And it ended up being really close, 20,000 votes, but, uh, but this is something the Republicans didn't fix. Republicans I work for, like, like there's a lot of very, you draw a big crowd from Long Island. So, I mean, Chairman Joe Cairo out there, the Republicans, he's like the Newt Rockney of uh, Republican chairman. I've seen him get all the candidates in a room and tell them they're not working hard enough, et cetera. It's like, it, it, cause he went to Notre Dame. It's so so he's, he's getting them out to, but they go after the absentees. They go after the early in-person voting and they go after election day. And there's, uh, Jesse Garcia does that in Suffolk County. Florida, they do that. They have it a science when Jeb Bush was governor, they fixed it back in 2000, and you get a thank you when you vote, you know when you voted. The main reason we started doing that was we didn't want to send mail and call people who had already voted. It's a waste of time and money. So the system in Florida, which is tracked by Republican, Democrat, uh, no party affiliation, you know when somebody's gone, gone and vote, and the Republicans there try to beat the Democrats every day. And the Democrats fight back the same way. But this is a big mistake for the Republicans because they, they got beat in 2020 in the early voting, and they didn't fix it. And the reason they didn't fix it is because they're too, the, the party structures in too many states are, are, you know, survive on this election day where you, you spend a lot of money on TV, and then you work on the, the final weekend on turnout. Well, like in Pennsylvania, uh, did you do uh, uh, the, the, uh, the polling? You did the polling for Fetterman, Fetterman and no, uh, but you had the governor, right? But how many absentee ballots were in there ahead of time? Like a million? Yeah, yeah. And what was the party registration? 70 30. I mean, they're losing already by four or 500,000 votes before the election starts. And, and they didn't, the Republicans don't do anything about it. They just, they just wait for election day and then it's too hard to catch up. There is this guy who's president maybe for a couple of years who may be to blame for this. I'm not sure. No, you guys, by the way, you do, you're doing a good job blaming him, but. He, you, he's you, the one who tells people not to vote early and in the, and in the mail, it's have, his fault. You'll have, uh, that's not true. But you'll have, that, that's true. they're all coming now. They're all coming down. But, but, but here, the interesting yeah. thing is the Republicans on election day said 60% of the Republic, people who voted Republican for Congress uh, voted on election day. Democrats, 
58% had voted early if they voted. So the Republicans are losing, they're not even playing the first quarter, second quarter, they're just showing up at halftime and expecting, trying to win the game, maybe the fourth quarter. So this was a big factor, and the Democrats have done two cycles in a row. So credit to Pat Cadell, the late Pat Cadell talking about that. And here, this is, when you talk about partisan parity, look at these numbers in terms of, we, we do these monthly polls and we go back, but it's been a battle for the generic ballot vote for Congress, and the Republicans had a lead, but the Democrats fought where they needed to fought, uh, fight so that they almost held the House, and they definitely held the Senate. But, and you can, see, you can see here where, to Jeff's point about in, among independent voters, the Republicans only won by five points. They needed more. The Republicans voted for Republicans 98 to two. Democrats voted for the Democrats 96 to three. And was their vote more, if you voted for the Democrat for Congress, was your vote more for Biden and the Democrat policies or against Republicans? They really voted for their own, 72 to 26. The most telling number, going back to the fact that the Republicans should have been running against Joe Biden, against the wrong track message, which most of the candidates I work for did, 68% said they were gonna vote for the Republicans. I'm a Republican, but I'm not crazy about our ideas. We needed higher rejection with 31%. Joe Biden's the president, the Democrats had the Senate, they had the House, and only 31% of those who voted for Republicans were voting against them. Republicans lacked the national message that could have prevented the choice election and made it, made it a referendum on Biden and the Democrats. And just to, just to get, before we go into questions, just to get into, uh, because uh, the primaries already started even before the election. What's really interesting to me is the vacuum on both sides where you've got Joe Biden in effect 26% where if you give him a choice, you know, th there's a lot of votes for other people, but he's going to have to, which is probably why he's trying to change the uh, calendar. Do you work for President Biden? Maybe. No. Okay. I'll, where do you see who he works for? That'll be a good candidate. But... <laughs> Give you, give you credit there. But in the meantime, but in the meantime, you can see the Democrats, it's wide open on their side if they get a live primary, which is why Joe Biden's moving dates around or trying to change it. And this was on election day, November 8th. Yeah, President Trump had been holding, like in a field of 12 candidates, had been holding over 50%, but he was still 47-27. There's lots of new polls coming out, we will see. For those of us who are old enough to remember Ronald Reagan, I, I do remember when it, Reagan was no longer going to be the nominee. It was going to be Phil Crane was the hot new. You would remember this, too. I used to work for Arthur Finkelstein, but this was before I worked for Finkelstein. He went to work for Phil Crane. They were going to have somebody new, bright, a young conservative. Reagan was too old, too extreme. He'd blow up the world. And, uh, but that's what primaries were for. Reagan came and won the primary. So with that, I'm going to pump back to you all because in summary, of, uh, in summary of my closing remarks, for us, my, my brother Jim and I, our polling firm, our candidates had a great day. They made their pollster look good. But for the rest of the Republicans, I think we had a missed opportunity. We really need to compete with the Democrats. If the rules are, you can vote every, if it's a month out, if it's two months out, whenever it is, we've got to start competing with the Democrats on that because, uh, um, you know, you can't get beat in the mail 60-40 and in person 51-47 then try to win it all on election day, and that's what that poll said. And as far as, uh, as, far as uh, uh, 2024 goes, the primary's on, and uh, I, still, I still think, you know, back in, back in 2015, a lot of people told me Trump couldn't be president. And what was interesting about there was a USA Today poll yesterday, 61% of the Republicans said they want somebody with Trump's policies, but there's a personality gap. So, so I'm going to tell him he should take some of Jeff's advice, <laughs> and we will, and we will see what 2024 brings. But thank you very much. Leah. <laughs> We're going to take. You guys are going to ask questions, yes? Yeah. I have, I have, I sort of, two, you know, my two things to to John since I get to go first and then he gets to go. <laughs> Um, and uh, again, we, we generally agree on things, and I, I'm, I am uh, far from a hard partisan, but my, my friend is being far too, defend, far too kind in defending Donald Trump, who is absolutely to blame for, for the lack of 
of in person uh, or early vote um, and all of the negativity about it. And I, he could fix it. Like I honestly believe he could go and fix it and get because it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, it's a complete strategic. It is a complete mistake, as you just said. Right? You can't be losing all those early votes um, uh, that often. And the system in Florida was built by the Repub like literally built by the Republicans, which is why it's it's so logical. Um, but I also think I think look if you look at the I mean, in Arizona, every single ad that they ran against Mark Kelly was that he was Joe Biden's crony. Every single ad that was aired in many of these places were about Biden. So I do think they tried um, uh, in a lot of these races. I think that these flawed Republican candidates, they were so problematic, Blake Masters being an obvious one, um, Oz being an obvious one, um, Herschel Walker, although again, 48% of the state voted for a man that I'm pretty sure can't sign his own name. Um, so, like, I, I, that is amazing to me, but, I mean, these are flawed candidates, uh, and candidates do, do matter, and the good candidates ended up winning. Take a guy in Nevada, like Joe Lombardo, I had nothing to do with that race, but that's a good candidate. Laxalt, good candidate, um, and why they, they did better than some of the others. You know, it's painful because in Arizona, I work for Jim Lehman, and, uh, in Pennsylvania, my brother Jim was doing the polling for McCormick. McCormick, yeah. So the sad part is... Yeah, we may poll for Trump, but if you hire us, it doesn't mean he's going to endorse your candidate. <laughs> yeah. So, but I thought we had better candidates. I agree with you on yeah. that. I, I thought that we had better candidates, and you know, maybe it would have been a different story. But, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. We got. We got. We, see, the good part is, you know, it, it's a, it's been like the Republicans without taking the House. This would have been a really. Yeah. There'd be like Republicans jumping in the Potomac. Uh, it'd be really ugly. But the uh, uh, but since it looked you know they've taken the house and uh, uh, some of those Senate races they should have done better but you learn from it it's painful but you learn from it so we'll see we'll see, we'll see going forward. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, we have about uh, let's say about 20 25 minutes for your questions and then about 20 minutes for your questions. Uh, and then there's a, a reception uh, upstairs. So just so we have Great. a sense of time frame. Okay. Thanks, Thanks sir. Go ahead. All right. Uh, let me ask one uh, political science nerd question. So uh, you know, political scientists would love to go to the American National Election Study. You know, you can do the same thing for 60, 70 years, yep. right? And if you just use presidential approval as a predictor of midterm election outcomes, right, it's just gone steadily up over yep. time. Yep. And then this year, you have that bizarre thing of all of these somewhat disapproved voters who are not vo or who are not punishing Democrats and, and the party, the president. So. Um, do we need to rethink, you know, political scientists have said that Tip yeah. O'Neill, all politics is local, is dead. Uh, and yet we got a lot of, uh, of some of that heterogeneity here. So could you talk about what the implications of this are for these ideas that, you know, congressional elections are no longer these local races, they're nationalized, they're presidentialized. How do we square that with what we saw? I think they all, they are still all nationalized and, and that what we had this year was so unique. I'm certainly unwilling to say that this, that the, the sort of predictive uh, nature of presidential job approval has been broken by this by this one cycle. Um, I think that there are so many unique things that that happened, um, uh, and and I talked about you know whether it's Dobbs or uh, and that talk about nationalizing an election, um, that's obviously a, a very real one. And so um, at the end of the day, the 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 Republicans, the what's the number one issue that voters were worried about in the nation? If you ask people, it's inflation. Well. One of the things about, and, and John pointed out in terms of the right direction, wrong track, many voters didn't blame Joe Biden for inflation. I don't blame Joe Biden. That's an, I'm not being a partisan. Like, I don't actually blame him. I blame 20 other things, COVID, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that, that actually are probably to blame for inflation. And I think at the end of the day, voters looked and, and many of them said, it's not really his fault. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. So the number one issue didn't dominate. And then you have abortion um, uh, and Republican extremism on some of these candidates, I think, jump up um, and break the, the streak. Um, but, uh, but I'm not willing to say that that's not going to happen four years from now or will happen four years from now. I, th I, I think this was a different kind of election in that usually it is a very good predictor, but it wasn't this year. And the reason was, was because the two parties, I mean, you're looking at partisan parity. In this election, you really have a 21st century look at a realignment that's coming in. Voters under 40 voting Democrat. And the Republicans haven't, they don't know how to talk to them. 
They're older people. They just they need to talk to voters under 40. There were some breaks in certain places on certain issues, but you now have 21st century voters. There's voters born in this century voting in this century, and you know we have a baby boomer president. The last president was a baby boomer. There's a big generational shift going on, and and uh, uh, the two parties are still in parity. But they're very different coalitions, and the independents are holding the sway. Actually, if I let me ask you a question about that, because there was a recent report that in New York State, blanks have now become yep. the second biggest voting block. Had, did you see that coming? What does that say about about both parties and where those voters are, and how they could uh, be messaged to from from either? I think the way they have to be spoken, to, they got you got to talk about issues they care about, and and as far as you know, when you look at the partisan parity that's happened, I mean, since the 90s, we've we really moved into partisan parity. All the century, you know, when we're talking about in, in 2002, the Republicans had a couple more voters come out, a couple percent. This time it was 3%, right? In the exit poll. Yep. It's, it's, that's not that much when a third of the voters are independents. And then you got to slice and dice these independents, and it's different in different parts of the country. It's different. I mean, they... The, the media, the way you talk to them. I mean, younger voters, you know, you know a lot of people were talking about TV. I was talking about TV with Chairman Cox before. Younger voters don't watch TV. They stream. Oh, none of my <laughs> students like, see me on TV like, at all. They exactly. have no idea what I do. It's like when you, you know, when they told me this would be on Google, I was like, okay, I've got to watch what I say today because it will be YouTube or whatever like that. But um, but it's there. And, and it, people go after information that they want. And... And, uh, um, and and there's a big there's a big really when you when you talk about going after the independents, it's much more complex and and more demassified than we ever expected. So yeah, look the the uh, we call them blanks here in New York. Uh, independents um, uh, are we're seeing an increase in the number of people who are registering uh, or saying they're independent because of the dissatisfaction with both parties. Um, and these younger voters in particular uh, are completely um, uh, turned off by, by both. The advantage the Democrats have is they're still voting for the Democrats. Um, and so, but that doesn't, that doesn't feel very good. Like if you're thinking about a long-term strategy uh, and you have all these people rejecting these partisan labels, both parties should be very worried about, about that trend. If I could pick up on the, uh, the theme of 21st century voters, um, as someone who spends most of his time with voters under the age of 25, uh, you know, uh, sort of a more attuned maybe to their concerns. So I had a question about democratic legislative accomplishments uh, in unified government, right? Uh, they, they did do a lot, uh, for good or for ill, depending on your perspective. Uh, how did that play out with voters? Uh, so I thought one idea is it could boost turnout uh, uh, among the base. It could potentially upset progressives that they didn't achieve everything that they thought they were going to do. Yeah. And there was always this concern that the party moved too far left uh, from yeah. what they had promised. So how did you see it uh, in your interactions and polls and focus groups? So uh, um, the Democratic accomplishments, it's interesting because I did, I looked at the numbers for all the various things that the Democrats did, um, Inflation Reduction Act, um, ARP, um, going back, all, you know, they're tremendous uh, uh, accomplishments that, that uh, the Democrats passed over these last two years. And the approval rating for all of those things was in the 60-40, 65-35 five range. So like very positive, so good things to run on. And if I thought back to the last time where policies were on the ballot in terms of what people um, were running on, um, uh, you go back to Obamacare, when the Republicans had a successful election, uh, uh, on Obamacare, something that, that Steve and I know a lot about in terms of losing a bunch of races in, in 2014, for example. Um, and the, the disapproval for Obamacare at the time was in the, let's just say, 55-45 range. Um, and so even the things that people were angry about, the positive accomplishments here, there wasn't a negative thing to run against the Democrats on other than inflation, which was an obvious thing. Crime, inflation, and, and New York is a whole different different story that we can talk about. Um, um, so I think that that the the policy stuff that that the Democrats did did allow them to to talk about things um, in a way that showed that they were actually getting stuff done. I have never been worried about there. There's always this, been this notion of oh, you didn't do enough for the left. Joe Biden's job approval with liberal Democrats, uh, progressive Democrats, has always been sky high. Like it is a 
it is a Twitter focused thing, not a voter focused thing. Like the reality is that the voters by and large have been satisfied. Um, I also don't think policy decisions tend to drive voters. I don't think absolving student debt all of a sudden makes the 21 year old uh, kid go out and vote. I think that that's just, I don't think that happens. Um, uh, and so I think you do those because they're the right things to do, but not because um, uh, it, it doesn't end up um, benefiting you, I think, from an immediate electoral perspective. F from my perspective, the word Democrat accomplishment should have never been a term during the election. It should have been like, the Republicans need to be aggressive. I mean, what's the accomplishment with inflation going through the roof? Most Americans think you're in a recession, the border's out of control, crime's out of control, people are getting, they're afraid to go out of their homes, go on the subway. You look over your shoulder on the subway so the movie's gonna push you. I mean, it, it, to me it's like, to me it's like uh, uh, the Republicans, the fact that, the fact that Democrat candidates could even have a discussion about their accomplishments was a failing of the Republicans. We needed to be totally aggressive, totally, you know, uh, uh, on offense. And uh, unfortunately, I, I think uh, that didn't happen. So, so they were able to talk about accomplishments and, and you know, save a lot of Democrats, particularly the governors. So, um, you had mentioned something as you're talking about Republicans earlier. I was thinking about this. Sometimes. We, I, I think as Democrats in New York sometimes, we like to think that the Republicans in New York are not national Republicans. That there's a bit of a, there's a difference. Yeah. Has that changed? Could a George Pataki get elected in New York today? George could get elected, definitely. I mean, he was, he was, he was polling well, but you know, he didn't want to, <laughs> he'd right. been there, yeah. done that. Yeah. Um, so, but, but on the other hand, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, the Republicans ended up having a primary. It didn't look like we would have a primary, but that was important for, I think, I think the Democrats wanted us to have a primary. But, uh, uh, but Lee did very well in the primary, won the primary. And, uh, um, but as far as, I, I think both sides are seeing the parties change even more internally because people are playing in their bases. I mean, that, those last couple of slides, when the majority of Republicans aren't with Donald Trump, it means his party's changing. And, and uh, when the majority is not with Joe Biden, the party's changing. They don't know who they want yet, but he's the president and he holds a lot of power. So, but I think the evolution, when you think about it, think about what voters have been through in the century. When you're looking at it, you said, okay, 2008, we had a near economic collapse. You were coming out of an Iraq war that didn't, didn't work and went from a big victory to an occupation that people weren't happy with. And then you go into COVID, economic shutdown, which was like a depression, and uh, uh, political polarization where you had two impeachments of the sitting president. I mean, the volatility here is much greater than, it's good for pollsters because we get to poll all the time, but it's, it's a lot more volatile and it's moving faster than people expect. And when you talk about younger voters, it's like, you know, I, I sympathize with younger voters because when are they gonna get a break? All of a sudden, it's like, you know, okay, but we'll, maybe we'll pay off the student loans. They come out of school and come out of university, and they're expecting to get a good job, and they're talking about layoffs now. You know, you're talking about a recession. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and after coming out of COVID, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, you know, you want to have, you want to get back to some sort of optimism and normalization of life. And I, and I, think, uh, I think that's going to be, uh, you know, a challenge going forward because even when you think things are getting better, it's it's not. I just have to say, for the students that are here today, we here at Roosevelt House do <laughs> offer very, uh, uh, we offer a lot of support for internship programs and jobs there after graduation, so I just want to make sure to make that plug for our students. I, I, I think, Basil, if you think about New York and what just happened, um, if Lee Zeldin does not have the noose of Donald Trump around his neck, um, and frankly, a, a position on choice that's fundamentally at odds um, with uh, a supermajority of the state. Uh, a, a more traditional, a George Pataki Republican, sure, could have won. Um, uh, and again, there's a lot of complicating things in terms of New York and what happened this year um, uh, and why it was so different. Um, but I do, but that, that extremism affected Zeldin. They ran a great campaign, um, helped that Mr. Lauder spent uh, close to $20 million um, uh, at the end of the day to, to help. Um, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a real, it was, it was certainly a real wake up call for, for lots of folks in all these blue states to say like, look, pay attention. If the voters are angry, um, you better do something about it. All right, with, uh, with permission, let's open it up to Q and A. Uh, and uh, we're gonna start with Harold Holzer. You need this mic, Harold? Yeah, let's, uh, Emily, do we have mics? Uh, here we go, here you go. Well, I'll, I'll use this. So, um, just want to point out that uh, uh, Mr. Lauder's brother gave Hunter fifty-two million dollars. I just want to put that put that part in when we're talking about the Lauders. I know that's, that's Leonard. So I have I have a, a question for our two pollsters. Um, the difference between a referendum election and a choice election. I want to posit something and see if you agree. What if you looked at this as a referendum election, because the ex-president positions himself as a de facto president. He says he didn't lose. He says, you know, I'm still gonna go. If you let me, I'll just take over the White House again. Couldn't you interpret the election? Is it possible to interpret the election as a referendum election on President Trump, who still insists that he's the president? The resistance to, um, to the quote, stolen election theory. Maybe. Um. I, may, maybe. Um, I mean, I really think, uh, that, you know, Trump inserted himself in the end in, in a bunch of places, and I know that, that my Republican colleagues, many of them were very unhappy about that. Um, uh, they obviously figured out how to um, hold him back in Georgia and not get him involved in the runoff, but it, it was too late. Um, I, I, I don't see it that way, Harold, I'll tell you. I, I saw the voters looking at individual candidates and rejecting them um, uh, in places and saying like, because in, in, in places that maybe it was a, a, a the, the extremism of January 6th and, and people who were tied to that, I think they suffered. I think a lot of those folks really rightfully um, suffered for, for their involvement and engagement in it. But I, I didn't see it really as a referendum on, on Trump in any way or a, or a referendum on him getting in. He was less in the conversation than, than we all thought. He might be. I don't know, John. I don't know. I saw a lot of Democrat ads tying my candidates to Trump. Yeah, that's, even if they yeah. weren't with Trump. Yeah, that's but extremism. It's, it's like, like every, you know. I mean, Mike Lawler was MAGA Mike. <laughs> that was in the TV ads. I mean, it, it's, and you all saw but, him. But it but, was, I, but MAGA is important. That's a, that's different. But, but like, by the way, different. I'm, that's I'm, different. I'm comp well, oh no, that's I know. Different. <laughs> it's like, well, no. the re the reason I think MAGA is different is that it's not just Trump. It's sort of it's not just saying you're a Trump Republican because we could have done that right in in that ad. And instead, MAGA brings in other stuff that's sort of Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene and extremism and and a feeling of of something that's that's bigger than just Trump. So I actually think it would have been a mistake to call Lawler Trump Lawler, um, and MAGA Mike was uh, brings in more stuff. Well, it, it was it was to to the professor's point. I, I think you know your point was the Democrats were hit every race they hit, whether the person was close to Trump or not, yeah. they hit him with Trump. And the Republican mistake was not turning it into a referendum on Biden, and that diffusion helped the Democrats because virtually all the races we had to win. Were, the Republicans were being hit on abortion and on Trump. And we were pushing back on inflation, on crime, on some places we were pushing back on abortion where, where we had to defend the position that we had that it wasn't that extreme, et cetera. And uh, you know, in most cases for us it worked, but there was, you know, if there was a lot of Democrats, it was bringing Democrats back. If you needed Democrats to win, it was bringing Democrats yeah. back to the Democrat Party. And that was the key thing, and the Republicans may have peaked like a couple weeks out, because nobody thought they were gonna take the House and Senate, and then all of a sudden the polls are saying, you know, and it, and it was a wave of pollsters across the country saying, oh, the Republic." and by the way, we had the Republicans in our October poll, mid-October nationally, we had the Republicans up six. Four points that ended up, nationally it's right, but it doesn't tell you what's happening in the local districts. And you can see the local districts, like my last poll for D'Esposito, I had him up one, and he'd been down 10. It's a, it's like a, his district got worse in reapportionment, where they got more Democrats in that district. But you have to carry, for those of us who, who you know, still do a lot of work in New York, et cetera, and other states that are tough to win, um, where there's more Democrats, you gotta take 20 to 25% of the Democrats to win. And if they go home, you're not gonna win. And to, to Jeff's credit, to his, a lot of candidates' credit, 
they were bringing them home and uh uh you know that was that was the real that was the real uh, um you know em emphasis the republicans should have made it a referendum on biden instead the democrats efforts to make it a referendum on trump and an abortion you know brought them like I don't know, 80, 90 percent of the Democrats in their areas, and, that, and the, when the part when the two parties are in parity, that's enough that you keep enough Democrats and the Republicans don't get a Senate majority, and they don't win more in the House. One thing that's important to go to you grab the next question, but in terms of the polls at the end, um, the the Republican pollsters and the Democratic the private pollsters, our polls were all very good. Um, uh, in the last two weeks. Garbage Republican pollsters. Not uh, I don't. Even, I shouldn't. I mean, they, I don't even know that these people are pollsters. There's, there's the firm Trafalgar. I'm pretty sure he makes up every bit of data that he does. I'm, I'm almost positive. Um, uh, anytime you see a poll that reports data at 48.4 to 48.3, you should be like, what? Decimal points don't matter. Um, um, so there was a f flood of garbage Republican polls in the last couple of weeks that f that completely tainted the averages, particularly the real clear politics average. If you looked at RCP real clear politics, you would have seen a more Republican average than on the 538 site because 538 does a better job of minimizing some of those garbage polls um, uh, in, their, in their weighted averages. If you took out those polls, the Democrats actually are in pretty good shape. If you look at the media polls, the public polls, um, they were actually all pretty good. And again, the, on the private side, I know what John did, what I was doing, all looked good. It was these kind of crap that flooded the zone. I'm still not quite sure why, um, but but that that really made a difference. Chairman Cox, and then I'm coming to you. Um, one factor that hasn't been discussed here that I've kind of looked at in elections. Another surprise election was the uh, Truman election, obviously, 48. I took a look at that. Econa wasn't given, given, hell, given hell, Harry. It was economy peaked and inflation was down. <coughs> Looking at this economy here, first quarter of this year, down. <coughs> Second quarter, down. Technical recession. Third quarter, 2.9%. Yeah. The indicia that uh, consumers follow of inflation the price of gasoline going down for whatever reason, yeah, or yeah. spro or whatever reason. Uh, I think the economy really had an impact on this at the end, but I'd like, obviously, yeah, pros I, here address No, uh, Chairman Cox, I, I don't disagree. I think the, 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 if the election were in the summer, um, when gas was at six dollars and or whatever it was here in New York, where it was worse, um, I think it's a problem. There's no question that that helped. Um, uh, at the end, the, that things got better towards towards November, and things have continued to get better as as we're seeing. So I I, I do think you're right that 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 had an impact, and and we shouldn't minimize it. At the same time, I still believe that even when the voters, uh, if if gas prices were a little higher or whatever, voters weren't blaming Biden for inflation. Like I would sit in focus groups, and they would say it to me, and and it was, I've done focus groups for years where people are like, I don't know, they have no idea about policy. It was amazing how many sort of swing voters who normally uh, aren't particularly erudite about things were like, yeah, I don't really think it's his fault. I don't, I, I don't blame him. Like, I'm annoyed and I'm pissed off, but I don't think it's his fault. I think it's a, a lot of other things. And that was, always, that was very interesting to me because I would have assumed they would have just done it. Maybe, as John said, there should have been more of a blame game if you were a Republican uh, on it. Um, but, but it didn't seem to be sticking with, with some of those middle of the yeah, being up. Yeah, yeah, being up. Yeah, people feel it. Absolutely. John, response to that? No, I, I agree with the chairman. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like there were, and you could see that's that's the power of uh, incumbency. They were doing things. You know, the idea of forgiving the student loan debt—that's a clear thing that you could do to help yourself, yeah. and and because they wanted the, they wanted certain voters in the coalition. But the idea of uh, using the strategic oil reserve yep. to, to lower the price of gas. I mean, that's the power of incumbency. So they were able to do things to alleviate it because like Jeff said, if it was in the summer, but it's, it wasn't in the summer, it was November. And you could see that they were doing things to ameliorate it. And the Republicans, on the other hand, going along with spending, I mean, it should be a healthy debate in the United States. The two parties are not, you know, unless it's really good and bipartisan, that, that, that we should agree on. But when you have a debate, if you're trying to debate somebody about inflation and you're going along with the spending bills, that doesn't work. 
because when, this, when the, when the uh, national debt goes from 21 trillion to 31 trillion, of course inflation's gonna go up. And the Republicans went along, and, and you've seen that now with this continuing resolution. If the Republicans go along, Jeff's gonna have a good, pretty good 24. I mean, you have to, you have to have, you gotta stand up to him on the spending, and you gotta stand him up to, if you wanna lower inflation, uh, you, you've gotta, you gotta tone down the spending and, and uh, allow the uh, private sector to go up. And, you know, I, I mean, the Republicans, they ought to, I don't know, these IRS agents, did you get your agent? I don't have an agent assigned to me yet, but I'm sure I will. Uh, <laughs> well, by the way, that was a weird, like, that was a weird, I never understood that. Always felt like a weird obsession in some of those ads with the IRS agents. Well, there's more, there's more IRS agents than FBI agents, so I don't know. It's I don't like think why. people gave a crap. I thought oh, I was do always if like, you pay taxes. No, we so. all pay taxes. But no, I, no. <laughs> clearly it didn't, because it didn't, oh. didn't move these races. Like, so much money was no, spent on I don't, it. I don't, I don't think, think it bothered people. I didn't think we had enough on it. So. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me, uh, let me just make a quick point on that, and then I'm coming to you, sir. Um, on the issue of economic improvement, I, I, I would just want to put an addendum on this. Uh, in 2010, as Mark knows, and as most of the gray hairs on Jeff's head and my head derive from 2010, when the Democrats lost 63 seats and President Obama's job approval was in the ballpark with Joe Biden's job approval now. 2010, we lose 63 seats, many people, don't see a path for Obama to get reelected. And what happens? 2012, Obama wins eight out of nine battleground states, and we pick up eight seats. We claw eight seats back. What happened? Two things. Number one, all of the hard work that members of Congress did to try and save the economy was not felt in 2010. It started to settle in empirically. In 2012, the economy gets better. People want to reward Democrats for that. They just feel more comfortable with things. And I would argue that the Republicans overread their mandate with the Tea Party class. And so you had the shutdowns and a lot of chaos and a lot of nuttiness going on in that cycle. And that ended up, Obama and the Democrats became a better alternative to Republicans. And so my, my advice to my Republican friends, and I'm, I'm literally getting on a plane to go meet with a bunch of them on Capitol Hill right now, not that they take my advice, but the advice is self-evident. If you want a path to retain your majority in 2024, right, you just can't repeat the mistakes that you made in 2010. You can't overread your mandate. Uh, and if the economy gets better, I think it becomes a much more difficult path for Republicans, my opinion at least. First, they need to figure out who's going to be speaker. That, yeah. That, yeah. I agree. Exactly. Sir. Yeah, so just a footnote on, on this, and it, it's been a, the mystery of this last few years, and then I'll get to my question, is talking about bad times, it sounds, you know, almost like the 37,000 Trump lies. We have 10 million jobs on offer. We've had that for years now on end. We have a very, very low rate of unemployment. We have an inflation which is rel has been quite low because it's been a statistical thing because of how they take real GDP growth. We've actually had large GDP growth, including, as was mentioned, 2.9% and going to 4% in 4Q. So the times, from the point of view of your typical voter, are in fact extremely good and they have to know that at some level because you can fool some of the people some of the time. You can't pull the garbage for all the people when you have the data saying that it's good times. The market, everything that the gentleman said is there. But my question with that in mind is you talk briefly as the deciding factor as it's been in my adult lifetime but mostly the case of what happens with the independents. That's where the uh, decision comes down in the purple states and, and, and elsewhere. You have some aberrations, abortion in Kansas is throwing a race here or there, but basically it's the independents. And so what I'm curious as to your views are, given that those are the numbers and they are going uh, up most probably is all the current data and indications notwithstanding the potential lag from the Fed increases, but it's unlikely to surmount all of the other things of 10 million jobs on offer. Where did the independents, how do they get influenced by that? And how does that look in terms of, you talked about 
them be more disaggregated, different in different places. But what are your conclusions about the independence given that operating environment? I think some people disagree with what you're saying. Is like, we're fortunate we're in Manhattan here, and I'm I'm seeing reports about food banks going up, and you know, like even where I live in Rockland, we're we're, we're giving the food to food banks, people I know, and people I know say they can't make their rent. And you're right about the unemployment number being low, but there's people that, you know, haven't gone back into the job market since COVID, and there's people still struggling. So. So I, I, you know, I, I, the Republican Party now is the party of the working class, and that's that's a major shift that happened under. And and I don't, Donald Trump may take the credit for it, but that shift was happening anyway. The the heartland of America is very upset about, you know, they're they're hearing about factory closings and they never got their jobs back, never got their health insurance back. Um, things are not as rosy as as people think, and and then. You know, so the unemployment, okay, it's low, but there's people that, a, like I said, that U6, that unemployment six where you don't go back into the job market, that's not, that's not recovered to where it was before COVID. So, um, so there's still challenges out there. And, and our party, because it is, has shifted to the working class and it has become more anti-China, more anti-trade, so it's a different discussion. And ironically, what used to be country club Republicans, uh, university people, they've moved towards the Democrats. And you're seeing the independents that look like that are, are more in the Dem Democrat party. So, uh, um, so, I, I, so I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of like disagreeing with the first premise part of your, your, your question. And I, and I think the, the tough part, I think, for the future, for the, whoever wants to be successful, is somebody really has to have a vision and a plan to, to, you know, provide some security, stability, and assurance to people at a very polarizing, volatile time. I mean, look at look at what's you know. I do work overseas, and and when you go to Europe, I mean, there's there's people shutting down their businesses for the months of January and February because they're not going to have enough energy, and it's all about the war next door. Governor Pataki, um, uh, we we did a radio interview together yesterday. He's just back from Ukraine where there's a war going on where tens of thousands of people are dying because the United States can't stop the war. And it should have never started. I mean, it, it, I mean, Putin used to be afraid of Trump. He's not afraid of Biden. And, and the corruption in the United States maybe gives him some, some confidence that he can keep this going on. But it's, it's a really not a good time in the world right now. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think at some point we've got to encourage, whether it's Jeff or me on both sides, we got to encourage our elected officials to make things better for people. And uh, it's, it's just, uh, uh, I, I, you know, we're going into the Christmas and the holiday season. I, I just feel apprehensive when I look at surveys and hear people's stories or focus groups and you hear from people and they're saying, you know, like they were having guest giveaways and some of my clients in Texas and stuff like that. And people will come pulling in saying it's the first time they filled up their gas tank. They couldn't afford it before. And now the price of gas is going down, so there's a little relief. But you start hearing these stories where they're deciding whether to feed their kids or whether to buy gas to go to work. And it's not good. So, uh, so I, think, I think that's what we've got to look at in the future. Jeff, response? And then I'm going to ask the final question. Uh, I think, look, I don't, I, none of us know where independent voters go um, uh, because that's the nature of the beast. We have to see where they go um, uh, and see whether they appreciate these democratic accomplishments, many of which are going to kick in. I mean, if you think even about um, some of the infrastructure stuff, um, part of the, uh, I think the, one of the democratic problems was a lot of that stuff didn't happen. It happened so late that, again, it, it's not there. People haven't seen the results of it. Um, so how do the independents feel? Um, how does the economy go in, in two years? I'm unwilling to, to predict the future. So um, the thing about independents, though, that's critical is um, one of the divisions that's super critical is independent men and independent women are, um, are uh, an apple and a kumquat. Um, uh, independent men, um, and these are over um, oversimplifications, independent men lean right, independent women lean left, um, and that gap and the difference um, has increased over, uh, over the last number of years. Um, part of that Trump, part of that extremism. Uh, and those independent women um, uh, are looking more democratic every day, which is uh, a good sign for us. 
Um, but then there are bad signs. The decreases for the Democrats in terms of performance with Hispanic and black voters and Asian voters in particular um, is something that needs to be a, a major concern. And some of those are also, in the, particularly the younger ones, registering as independents. So um, we'll see. Let me ask the final question, and then we can go upstairs. Uh, there's a reception. Uh, we can continue the conversation for those of you who are able to uh, stay with us. This uh, event is uh, organized by the Democratic Study Group, uh, or Dem Democracy Study Group at Cornell University, not the Democratic Study Group. That was a, the former life. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I saw a, a spate of polls in September, October, several polls, uh, where voters said that they were concerned about democracy. That, that was one of the concerns they had, the yes. state of democracy. I also saw, when I dug into those polls, if you were leaning to the right, you believed that Democrats were the threat to democracy, and if you were leaning uh, to the left, you believed Republicans were the threat to democracy. When it was all said and done, after the midterm, did democracy or the state of democracy matter to voters in this midterm election? Oh, it definitely matters. And, but the bad part is they're seeing it through a partisan lens in a lot mm -hmm. of places. I mean, I, I worked for the, the House majority in uh, uh, Georgia. And uh, the, unfortunately, the speaker uh, passed away recently after the election. But Speaker Rawlson got the law changed so that they could have voter ID to improve confidence, et cetera, in the election. And he got vilified for it at the time because of partisan uh, things. Because now we're fighting over you know, just like we fought in the propositions in New York in 21, uh, we're fighting over these election rules, and whatever the election rules end up, we got to play with. But in Georgia, nobody said they were denied the right to vote, and Herschel Walker lost, and Governor Kemp won. And uh, uh, so, so I think because you get through these elections, I, I think they, uh, you know, state of democracy, yeah, both sides on the partisans, we're each looking for advantages you know, legally, advantages that helps our, our candidates win. But on the other hand, when it's all said and done, I think uh, everybody respected the election results and it is what it is and the Republicans are a little deflated because we missed a big opportunity and, the, and uh, the, or to have a bigger opportunity. And the Democrats are relieved that they didn't have a near death experience. So it's, uh, you know, democracy goes on, the debate goes on. Right. So 2024 will be really exciting. <laughs> Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think Georgia is the best example on many, many levels. Um, the Republicans changed the rules that they thought were going to help them, and they ended up biting them in the ass. Um, uh, for example, shorter day of voting, fewer voting hours. We in New York, we vote all day, right? We, are, we literally, you can vote till 9 o'clock. The Republicans in Georgia shortened the window. Then what happens? No mail in, no mail in voting, no early voting, so we're just going to vote on election day. And the hours are shorter. Like it actually, actually is it's, like it's a, always been seven o'clock. No, I, I uh, closes no. at seven. Yeah, yeah, seven. yeah, yeah. It's always seven. The, the they like to close. I remember when Mac Mattingly lost. It was seven o'clock. Yeah, here it's nine o'clock. Um, you got to vote in Georgia. You know. You the, <laughs> but I'm actually crediting. But well, we secured the, the drop box. I'm crediting the governor. Like yeah. the, if you look at the governor who ends up winning the election because those suburban voters who looked at Republican extremism said. You know what? This guy stood up to Trump. He stood up to extremism. Same with the Secretary of State there. Um, and they were rewarded for that uh, in terms of democracy and like standing up for, for things that are democratic. And I, I think they deservedly got, get some credit. I, not people I would vote for, but that's, but I think they did get credit from those voters. And on the flip side, people who were more on the extremism, anti democracy side got rejected, and I think we saw that all over the place. You mean Stacey? So, Stacey so, got rejected? No, I, I think <laughs> Stacey never had, I, I don't, I don't think she, an extremist, I, I and don't he think called she, her an extremist. But, I, but, so I, like, yeah. but he, he ran a good campaign, he, you know, he, but the he important did a good thing, job. No, the important uh, thing was, nobody said their civil rights were denied. No. It was an honest election. Yeah, I agree with all that. Both I don't, sides are I don't like, think that's anybody it. wants two hours of voting lines, though. That's like an inhuman, stupid thing. Like, I can't imagine that's why we want that. They have they have no excuse absentees. Right, they have no excuse absentees. They do, they, and and they also have plenty of early voting, in-person voting, and it, you know. But it nobody, went on for nobody weeks. wants two hours of, of lines. So like, they, they, we have to do things to make things easier for people to vote. Like nobody wants, not Republicans, not that nobody wants to stand in line for two hours. Yeah, but most so people. So that's didn't. a that's a no tons of most people, people did in Georgia. 
So, I mean, I think so, I think we have to. If they waited till election I think, day. I think <laughs> de democracy was was there. I am so pleased that we did not have election deniers this cycle. It is remarkable, really, that we yep. had almost nothing um, uh, on election day, and and that is a a blessing. And hopefully, we can move on from that insanity because we need faith in democracy, de democratic institutions to exist, so that we can continue to do what we do. So at the uh, Cornell Brooks Public Policy Institute of Politics and Global Affairs, it is a mouthful, but you get amazing dialogue and an exchange of views uh, and uh, insightful and provocative uh, conversation. Uh, we are so glad that you joined us. For those of you who are able, uh, Basel, the reception is? Um, the reception is technically two flights up. It's on the first floor in the Four Freedoms Room. And just before you close out, I just want to say again, thank you for coming. For those that have never been here before. This is the former home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and uh, the second floor where we met before we came down here was the room where the New Deal was actually sketched out. Um, and uh, we like to think of our uh, little home here as a place where big ideas get discussed. And I wanted to thank you all for um, talking about big things and big ideas while you were here. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank Professor you. Schmeichel. Thank you, Professor Kreiner, John, and Jeff. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, sir.